Good morning. I've not started preaching yet. You can do better. Good morning. It is a, a gorgeous Lord's Day. A uh, little hot, humid, especially when you go outside with your glasses on and you can't see anything for a minute or two. And it was fun biking this morning. I, I tell you, I did 10 miles, but uh, sweat kept falling on my glasses and I couldn't see. I need some windshield wipers or something. And uh, I come in and I try to hug Tammy after I've had a long bike ride and she doesn't like me to do that. Uh, she makes me shower and then I hug her. We're going to be in Revelation 17 this morning. Think about victory in Jesus. I, I, now look, I, I know some of you may not know this. You may not know me all that well, but uh, if you do know me well, if you don't, here's a tidbit. I am a Kentucky basketball fan. Fanatic is probably a, a better word. I, I, I grew up not far from Lexington, all right, and, and Kentucky basketball was bred into me. When my, at least it's not A&M, all right, when my grandmother died, there were arrangements of Kentucky blue and white and UK, and she loved it too. I never will forget CBS Sports won't let me forget. They keep showing it over and over and over. But when I was in senior in high school, March the 28th, 1992, Kentucky was in the Elite Eight playing Duke for a chance to go to the Final Four. It is, many people say, the greatest basketball game ever played. In overtime, in the last 45 seconds or so, there were five lead changes. Each possession resulted in a lead change. And Kentucky got the basketball to Sean Woods. He hit a basket. And Kentucky was up 103 to 102. We were with a bunch of church folks. 2.1 seconds left on the clock. We're jumping up and down. Dad and I are hugging each other. We're going to the final four. We're going to the final four. Duke had called a time out. Somehow, they got the ball to Christian Leitner, who made an impossible shot. Duke would go to the Final Four. Duke would win the 1992 National Championship. If Kentucky had gone to the Final Four, they likely would have won. Really, that Elite Eight was for the National Championship. You know, sometimes that's just the way it works out. We thought we had victory. Victory was in our hands. I mean, we are jumping up and down. Kentucky has won that game. And then victory was snatched right out from under us. And you see in Lexington and throughout Central Kentucky t-shirts that say, I still hate Leitner. That is a game that Kentucky fans will never forget. Sometimes, victory is snatched from our hands when it's not a basketball game. As much as I love Kentucky basketball, as much as I think they should win the national championship every single year, it's just a ball game. Doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. At least I tell myself that. But there are things that do matter. And it might seem this morning as you sit here that you had victory. 
but it was snatched right away from you. Maybe it's your job. Maybe you're sitting here and you thought you were going to have your dream job. It didn't work out that way. Maybe it's your marriage. You thought you had married a wonderful person. And now you wonder how you're going to make it. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe you're struggling to keep your head above water. Maybe it's your health. There's pill after pill and doctor after doctor. Sometimes victory slips right through our fingers. The folks to whom John wrote needed to know about victory. They are being asked to put their lives on the line. You know, we talk about my dream job didn't come through. My marriage is in the pits. My finances are in the pits. My credit rating is in the basement. My stocks aren't doing well or whatever. These folks knew about victory going through their fingers because they were going to die for the faith. They would be asked, Christ or Caesar? If they answered Christ, they would die. More often than not, in horribly painful ways. If they said Caesar, they would live if they denied the Lord. And Jesus came and gave the revelation to His servant John for these Christians to help them understand that victory was coming. This morning, we're going to study one verse. I had Billy read the context. But we're going to study one verse, Revelation 17, 14. Revelation 17, 14 is the theme verse of the book of Revelation. You cannot, you know, I, I don't care if you understand Revelation or not. I don't care if anything in Revelation makes sense to you or not. I, I, I really don't. But I do care that you understand Revelation 17.14. Because Revelation 17.14 is the heart of the matter. And Revelation 17.14 is the heart of our lives. It's what's going to help you get up of a morning. It's what's going to help you when you get that diagnosis you don't want. It's what's going to help you when your marriage is in the pits, your finances, or your faith, or anything else. Because Revelation 17, 14 is the heart of Revelation. And it can be the heart of our life. And there's one message. One message I want you to get this morning. That you need to understand. That you need to live by. Jesus Christ will never lose. Jesus Christ will never lose. This past year was abysmal for Kentucky basketball. It was hard to watch the game. They're not going to win every game. Jesus Christ will win every time. You know, sometimes there's a big game and you don't know if your team's going to win or not. You hope they do. So much is on the line when it comes to sports and you just want that team to win or maybe your political candidate to win or whatever. You're not going to win every time. But Jesus will. 
every time. Jesus Christ will never lose. Revelation 17, 14. They will make war on the Lamb. And the Lamb will conquer them. He'll win. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. They will make war on the land. John has just described the beast. Nero, I believe, in context. Talking about the Roman emperors, I believe. And then there are these ten kings who do not yet have a kingdom. I don't know who they are. I, 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 I don't. But that's not important. In context, the idea is that these kings make war on the Lamb. And there are many today who make war on the Lamb. While you pick up a newspaper, you can read about a little boy who was murdered by a stepmother. You can read about judges and politicians redefining marriage or other things. You can read about people trying to stifle Christian speech. You can read about child abuse and murder and aquariums and after Astros games and so much evil in this world. They make war on the Lamb. There are many folks today who, if you will, have it out for Jesus and they will make war on the Lamb. But, but, although they make war, war on the Lamb, the Lamb will conquer them. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of those to whom John wrote Revelation. You're really suffering. I mean, really suffering. So that's something you and I really don't know a whole lot about. Not like they did. They're facing real persecution. Real persecution. And John says they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. Folks, the Lamb's a weak animal. If you're in war, you really don't want a lamb. You, you, you know, if, if you're going against the enemy, you don't want the image of a lamb leading you in the battle. You see, David had to rescue his lambs, his sheep, over and over from lions and bears. Jesus said, John 10, 12. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. You see, they need somebody to guard them. A wolf can come and just devour them, take them away, kill them. A lamb's not a very Powerful image. But you understand. It's because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that He gives us the victory. You see, the Lamb will conquer them. That reminds us that Jesus, as the Lamb of God, laid down His life for us. Sacrificed Himself for us. As John the Baptizer sees Jesus coming toward him, he proclaims, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.
Revelation 5, 6. John's told the lion of the tribe of Judah can open the book of the seven seals. And as he looked, he saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And it had been slain for the sins of the world. And only because that lamb gave himself for the sins of the world for you can he be the one who gains the victory. You know, one day the lamb will have complete and utter victory. I mentioned that in today's world, you still find those who make war on the Lamb. Hmm. I watch KPRC every morning after I've read my Bible. Sometimes you just want to turn it off. Just turn it off. Because there are folks who are making war on the Lamb. That's what they cover every morning on the news. But one day, one day, Jesus will burst through the skies with glory and He will have complete and utter victory. Paul described that victory in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul says, verses 7 and 8, that God will grant relief to you who are afflicted, suffering persecution, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. There is victory. When you're watching KPRC of the morning and they're talking about all these horrible stories, one day, one day, Jesus will come through the skies with that sound of the trumpet with flaming angels inflict vengeance on His enemies. He will have the victory. The Lamb overcomes because He is a Lamb, because He died for the sins of the world. But also because according to Revelation 17, 14, He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus has authority over every king, over every Lord. You know, when Queen Elizabeth opens Parliament, I, I enjoy watching that. I, I, I'm a nerd, okay? And the splendor and the glory and the majesty, their customs, it, it's something to watch. And all the gold and diamonds and rubies and other jewels. Oh, a queen... But Jesus is Lord of the Lords and King of the Kings. God has exalted Him to the highest place and therefore He can give victory. In Ephesians 1, 20 and 21, Paul talks about the exaltation of our Lord Jesus. God worked great power in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. God has exalted Him to the highest, Place. He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Philippians 2, 9-11 to 11. 
God has highly exalted him. God hasn't just exalted Jesus. It may be wrong to speak of the exaltation of Jesus according to Paul here. God didn't exalt him. God highly exalted him above everything and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The highest place. Lord of lords. King of kings. The highly exalted Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. And has been exalted above everything else. He has the victory. And those with the Lamb are called and chosen and faithful. They have been called out of the world to be different. They're the call of God. It's a reminder. God called Christians to be special and Paul told the Thessalonians they've been called by the Gospel. That's how God calls us through the proclamation of His truth. And they're chosen. Christians are God's special people. I, I, I don't have time to get into it. But I believe the whole of Scripture teaches that God chose to bless Christians. He, he didn't choose who would be a Christian. He didn't choose you and not somebody else. But yet, God chose that in Christ, as Christians, we would receive great blessings. And those with Him are faithful. If you want to have victory in Jesus, you need to be faithful. Oh, folks will make war on the Lamb. Make war. But He will conquer them. Because He is Lord of lords and King of kings and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. There is victory in Jesus. Jesus Christ will never lose. Never But how do you live? Since Jesus is not going to lose, how should you live your life? Let's be honest about it. Does it not appear oftentimes that Jesus is losing the war? Does it not? Tammy and I had a stressful week. Very stressful. I had surgery on Tuesday, minor little outpatient thing, but they call it surgery. I had a cardiology appointment on Thursday because the doctor found an enlarged heart. And that turned out okay. I exercise a lot, and that's the cause of it. He's 99.9% .9 sure. We're, we're going to do a little testing to make sure. Before we went to cardiology, Tammy's brother sent her some videos of her dad and Pitiful. It's beyond pitiful to watch this man of God become more or less this vegetable who doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I, I mean, come on. Are you going to tell me that in life like that, that Jesus is never going to lose? When life doesn't go well, when it hurts, when you cry those tears at night, are you really going to tell me Jesus doesn't weep? How can you live? 
are one. My brothers and sisters, you never, ever lose heart. You don't lose heart. It might look to you and to me that Jesus is losing, but let me tell you, He will not. He'll never, ever lose. So you and I can take heart knowing that there is victory in Jesus one day. One day day there will be complete, complete victory in Jesus. Paul writes in the context of death, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57. 1 Corinthians 55 to 57. Oh, death, where is your victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you stand at a grave, when you see a godly man declining because of all wonders, when you get that pink slip, when you have to go for surgery, when the doctor doesn't know what's wrong, or when it's serious and they do know what's wrong. Don't forget 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57. Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is it? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Don't lose heart. There's going to be victory. Victory in Jesus. Revelation 21, 27 of that new Jerusalem. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When we get to that new Jerusalem, there's going to be victory. Nothing, no, nothing unclean, no, no disease. No sin, no pink slip, no finance. Gonna enter it. But those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there's victory in Jesus. Because Jesus will never lose. But let me ask you, what is it that's defeating you this morning? I, 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 I don't know your life. There may be something that's defeating you that no one else here knows about. Some sin you struggle with. Some marriage issue, finance, I, I, I don't know. But I'm sure there's something in your life that's weighing you down. That's making you feel like you're defeated. Here's what you here's what I want you to do. Write it down on a piece of paper. Write down your worries. Write down what's defeating you. And then I want you to take that paper and tear it up in the smallest pieces possible. You know why? There's victory in Jesus. Because one day he's going to have utter complete victory. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Victory 
in Jesus. Two, you need to be with Jesus. Notice what the text says. Revelation 17, 14. They will make war on the Lamb, but the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him, those with Him, if you want victory in Jesus, you need to be in Jesus. You need to be a child of God. You need to be with Him. No other way to have it. Those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. When the people of Israel had constructed the golden calf, Moses stands before them and he asks this question. Acts 32, 26. Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. You remember the Levites came to him. That's why they were the priests and those who served at the temple and in the tabernacle before that. But that Call that question. Who is on the Lord's side? That's not just a call in the wilderness of the golden calf. That's a call to every generation. And that's a call to you. Who is on the Lord's side? Are you on the Lord's side? If you want victory in Jesus, you have to be. Those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Those with Him. Are you with Him? And then... It's not enough just to be with Him. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Called and chosen is the work of God. God calls us through the Gospel, he chose before the world was to bless Christians. It's the work of God. They are called and chosen. But then that last one. Called, chosen, and faithful. There's your response. It's not enough to be called and chosen. God did that. You need to be faithful. Jesus. There's no other way to have victory. Jesus told the church Smyrna, Revelation 2.10, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I hate the translations that say, Be faithful until death. That's not what Jesus said. Not at all. That's not the Greek. That's watering it down. The Greek is be faithful unto death, to the point of death. Jesus is speaking to people who are going to die for the faith. They're not worried about being faithful until death. Now that's important and necessary and involved in what Jesus says. Don't get me wrong. But these folks were going to have to be faithful even if it killed them literally. That's what Jesus says. Be faithful unto death. Unto death. Even if they burn you at the stake. Put you in a big old frying pan like they used to do and fry you because you're a Christian. 
dip you in oil and make you a lamp on the emperor's driveway. They cut off your head if they do whatever. Feed you the beast. Be faithful. Even then, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Your body is not going to have the victory. None of our bodies will, by the way. I mean, I know I'm handsome and in good shape and all that stuff. But the body's not going to win. It's going to rot, decay, and then Jesus will raise it up a new body. You see, bodies die, souls don't. And yes, there will be a bodily resurrection at the end, but we'll get new bodies, not these that we inhabit. New ones that don't wear out, that don't get sick, that are fit for that spiritual kingdom of God. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. You see, the body is going to die, so why try to hold on to it? Why try to have victory in it? There's victory in Jesus. And be faithful to the point of death. If you want a good description of what being faithful is, look no further. Then 1 Corinthians 15, 58. My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Why is it not in vain? Because there is victory in Jesus. Jesus will never lose. You will. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. That's, that's part of why. A&M's not going to win every game. They shouldn't win any, by the way. But Kentucky's not going to win every game. You're not going to have victory in every walk of life. Doesn't work that way. But it does with Jesus calls there is complete, utter victory in Him. Do you have that victory this morning? Are you faithful? Claim that victory in Jesus. Would you need to come and claim that victory? right now as we stand and see.